welcome once again to the Buffalo History Channel. This is Doug Ruffin. I'd like to thank you all for checking out the uh, video that we aired previously about the, uh, the history of the Black Dance Workshop, Watu Sakoni, the Center, of, Center for Positive Thought, the School of Movement, all in one building at 11 East Utica. And we, it was great to tell that legacy. We got a call from Gail and she wanted to talk more and expand on what was, actually, what was actually going on in Buffalo around that time and even in this time was the Buffalo Creative Arts Renaissance. So, we're, so on, in this video, we're gonna expand on it. So Gail, I would like to uh, welcome you back to the Buffalo History Channel and talk about why we're, why we're doing, this, doing this video right now. Well, um, there was a very special moment in Buffalo history that combine music, poetry, dance, and theater, very much like the Harlem Renaissance. And that was a legacy that began before I came to Buffalo. Many of you know I came to Buffalo in 1967 to go to the University of Buffalo. But some people think that our musical history and our innovation stopped at a certain time. So people know the story of say the Colored Musicians Club. Right. They might not really know the story of Rick James. They might not really know the story of the Vermilion Room. They might not really know the story of all these other individuals that really made their mark, some known and some unknown um, on the city of Buffalo and on the national um, uh, artistic community um, from radio. Like when I got to Buffalo, there was two DJs that were in New York City that were the number one DJs in New York and they were from Buffalo. Frankie Crocker. Frankie yes. Crocker ran New York City, okay? WBLS, he put for me, Buffalo on the map, if I didn't know about Frankie Crocker, I probably never would have came to Buffalo because everyone was talking about the Bills, but everyone I knew was talking about Frankie Crocker, yeah. the African Cultural Center, yes. which had a huge connection with Olatunji, who was on 125th Street with a major dance company and drum company that was associated with Malcolm Erni, who was perpetuating the Yoruba um, cultural traditions out of Nigeria, and Olatunji was out of Nigeria. So, um, and then there was Imhotep Gary Bird. Absolutely. Gary Bird, it, unfortunately, Real. Frankie <laughs> Crocker is passed away. But I believe that there is a documentary on Frankie Crocker's life and the impact he had on Black radio. So people need to know that legacy. That Wolfo legacy was a strong legacy. We used to call it Rundown at Sundown. That's right. Because <laughs> it went off whenever the sun went down. Mm -hmm. I remember signing it, it off, off. Even, in my, <laughs> even in my day, which was back in like 2007 when I started there. I was signing it off there. Then it, it right. Gone. So in the summer, you can listen until like 9.30. In the winter, they was off at 4.30 or 5 o'clock. So whenever the sun went down. Right. But they were powerful, even though um, you had WBLK with the hound dog. Sound of the hound. Um, yep. Ooh, the sound. Listen, we would hear that. Um, and we were uh, very attached to radio. As a people, we are still very attached to radio. Um, we love TV, but there's a special connection that we have with radio because that's where we got all of our music. So people don't remember MTV. They didn't start playing Black music or Black videos until Michael Jackson was grown. I remember. Okay. So if you wanted to hear what was going on musically, you had to be in tune to the radio. And I remember when I first heard 
for a woman from Nina Simone, that was on the radio. Okay, so we were still being introduced to great music on Black radio. Also, Black radio was the ear of the community. When I first heard Malcolm speak, it was on the radio. When I first heard James Baldwin, it was on the radio, just like now you will hear like Al Sharpton or, you know, uh, great orators, preachers and everything on the radio. That's the same thing that happened during this black arts movement, which included dance. And that was ushered on with um, Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey took the black experienced and put it to dance in a way that no one has ever done before. But there were other illuminaries who were looking at Black dance. We were the first one. When I say we, the Black Dance Workshop was the first one to promote Catherine Dunham with the Dunham technique. If you go anywhere and you talk about Black dance, you will learn about a certain technique called the Dunham Technique. She was an anthropologist, she, as, as a, a trained anthropologist. She went to Haiti, the Caribbean, and captured all of these dances and all the history and culture behind these dances. So why is this important? Because it was the Black arts movement during that time, I'm talking about the middle of the 1960s and maybe as early as the end of the 1950s, but from what I know from the 1960s, it was part of our search for our identity. We recreated who we were, just like hip hop is creating who we are today. We created who we were and who we wanted to be through our music, our dance, the way we played ball, the way we talked on the radio, all of that was weaved into this new identity that we took on as Black power and Black is beautiful. And, and everybody had an Afro, everybody had an Afro. And not only did we wear our hair um, natural, but we were braiding our hair, we were twisting our hair, we were doing all kinds of creative things with our hair, we were, you know, wearing the big hoop earrings, um, all of these things, wearing African clothing, all of that was started in the 1960s and then perfected because look at what we're doing now with the way we wear our hair, with the way brothers are wearing their hair, you know, comes full, circle. comes full circle. And so I thought that was really important to share because you don't hear many people talking about, now you do a little bit because of Lorna's passing, you know, may God bless her in you know, her transition. And we lost the giant when we lost Lorna. Um, I know that she can never be replaced, but there was um, a Monty Music Workshop, a group of incredible singers. And I cannot remember Anne's last name, but somebody that's listening will remember. Um, the amazing singers that were part of this group. Um, Nia Writer's Workshop. Um, Alnisa was a poet with Nia Writer's Workshop. Most people don't know Alnia, Alnisa is a great poet. She was writing poetry before she started writing commentary for the newspaper. Speaking and she, she is amazing, not only amazing poet, but Alnisa was um, 
part of the teaching faculty for the Freedom School. Many people don't know we had a number of Black schools here separated from public schools. Freedom schools, now Valley Shule, these are things that we need to capture. You and I had a conversation about Bill's Academy. Bill's yeah. Academy is a premier, like one of the best examples of a community neighborhood school. They had programs after school, right? Yep. We pioneered the charter school movement. In you pioneered the charter school movement was Build Academy. And that's where we started the Black Panthers Breakfast for School Children. It was at Build Academy. So the other thing, um, so besides Nia Writers Workshop, Imani Music Workshop, Ujima Theater Workshop, there was something called the Black Drama Workshop. Yes. And that was headed up by Ed Smith. Ed Smith used to do a lot of work with Lorna because he was a director, an uh, excellent actor and a director. And he was on the faculty at the University of Buffalo. So I want to talk a little bit about how faculty were instrumental in um, some of the um, progressive things that Buffalo did. There's a lot that faculty did during that time. Malifi Asante, who was the one who, he was at the University of Buffalo. He was the chair of the communication department. While he was at the University of Buffalo, he developed the, the theory and the philosophy of Afrocentricity, right? Went on to, um, to write major books about this concept of African thought being at the center of your existence, just like Eurocentric history. He said that, you know, we needed to place Africa in the center of our story and everything emanated from that African experience. It was, it was Malifi who first brought Milana Karanga to Buffalo. In fact, he um, not only um, brought uh, Milana Karanga, but he also had this concept called the way, this idea that African culture should be determining the way you live your life the way you think about things, the way you eat your food, the way you dress. So he was taking this whole idea of um, internalizing African thought and African culture in the remaking of our focus as African-Americans. Because I remember when we had this big argument, we being, um, young people about whether we were going to be black or African. That was a big argument. And um, at Buff State, it actually changed the name of their student organization. Buff State started out with the Black Liberation Front. And I want you to know, we at UB, because I was a founding member of the Black Student Union, we were like saying, God, we should have thought of that. <laughs> You have the same thing going on today with uh, African American and ADOS and foundational Black American. So now we on that now. It goes right. in cycles. And guess what? It's all just evolution. It's all just development. So we had a big argument and um, at Buff State, they became the African American Student Organization. And because of that, students broke off and they started the Caribbean student organization because they felt like we're not African American. They knew they were African, but they didn't want to, but we were saying, well, you in the America. Going on today. Right, right. Big, big time today on, the, on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but wait a minute. You, you know, 
we wanted to take that idea of America or the Americas just being the US, mm -hmm. the United States of America. We were saying, listen, anything over here in these waters, North and South America has the right to the name American and it's not just the right of the United States to carry that name. Um, we didn't win that argument. Um, but because people wanted to find for themselves who they are. And so they wanted to be Afro-Caribbeans and not Afro-Americans or African-Americans. But we had that debate back at that time and you saw that happening. You had um, Jim Pappas and um, another, uh, another group of people start what was the most, um, amazing concept for a cultural center because we were the center for positive thought, but they were the Langston Hughes Center. Yes. And I want you to know they built that center. I think they got a grant of something like almost $500,000. If you can imagine what that money was in today's market, it would be millions of dollars because they did pottery, jewelry, um, all kinds of artistic expression with your hands. Um, paintings, uh, Dini YG, Yep. was named then, and now he's Amin Ra, but yep. he was <laughs> an amazing uh, jewelry maker. I mean, the brothers, there were some people making some jewelry here and in Rochester that were amazing jewelry makers. And look at his prodigy, Adris. Absolutely. I mean, you know. Talented brother. Right. I That's said <laughs> there would be no address if there wasn't Amin Ra. <laughs> Ra is just amazing. Bill Cooper. Look at Bill Cooper and the influence that Bill Cooper had on the artistic community now. He set the stage back then because no one was painting in the way that Cooper was painting back when he was doing what he was doing with paint and, and everything. Um, um, we had a black co-op back then that came out of model cities. In fact, cool. yeah. you know, people, people sleep in model yeah. cities and, 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 okay. So I talked about faculty. I talked about Ed Smith, a member of the faculty, Jim Pappas, a member of the, of the faculty. Um, Pappas, a member of the faculty, the, the, the people that we brought to Buffalo, Pearl Primus, UB played a major role because they brought Pearl Primus, amazing dancer, anthropologist. She's the one supposedly that brought Funga to the Americas interpreted it and gave you all the movement and the song. We were looking for authenticity. We got that from the African-American Cultural Center because they were working with Alatunji. Alatunji taught you the dance and the song and the movement and the music and the heat because he came from the culture. He, he knew his culture. Um, you had amazing people like uh, Senior Hainsworth, an amazing drummer, um, working with the African American Cultural Center, experimenting with dance. Um, our lighting guy, Steve Porter. Steve loved um, samba, but it was Pearl Reynolds who was the master and taught us and, and others about the um, legacy of Catherine Dunham. Um, that legacy of Catherine Dunham is told um, by, oh, 
who's the one that wrote uh, uh, and um, and I rise, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou, yeah. Maya Angelou danced with Catherine Dunham. She talks about her entree to the arts, and you know, she taught tells her story about how she didn't talk. Remember, she said she spent most of her childhood. She was so traumatized, she didn't even speak. She couldn't even find her voice. She found her voice through dance. Right. That's how I found my voice. I found my voice through writing and dance because I was writing for the um, Black Student Union. They had a newsletter. I was writing for it and Cardiamo, well, Shasante was writing for it. Our niece and I and Michael Copeland started a magazine called Buffalo After Dark. I was a co-editor. I was going to so ask some, you about that. Mm -hmm, so some people know. So I danced. I would write. And I also played the cello and the upright bass. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I love playing the gym bass. So I want to shout out to um, the brothers that have come here and um, Mbaye, who, mm -hmm. you know, really started um, drumming in the Senegalese style of drumming to Buffalo, but there was Emil Latimer who yeah. bought the, the, um, the um, drums to Buffalo, that was a major um, part of the uh, national music world with Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair, which he sang with Nina Simone. Nina didn't let nobody sing with her, okay? Mm -hmm. No, and nobody, you find me a record where somebody is singing with Nina Simone. There's only one. And that was Emil. And Emil was a master guitarist. And we forget all the musical instruments, you know, guitar, drum, uh, what was it? A uh, little, well, I forgot his name. They used to sing, <laughs> used to sing the blues. Buffalo was known for the blues. Uh, little something. Little Lucky something Peterson. Peterson. Lucky little Lucky Peterson. Yeah, Little Lucky Peterson. Academy <laughs> alumni, by the way, yes. Yes, I mean, he, he was a, a blues phenomenon, okay? Oh, yep. Yes. So Grover Washington? Of course. Of course. So I just want people to remember the richness of that history and just to never uh, forget it. I'd like them to research it and see, because I just named easy 10 or 12 um, cultural institutions or individuals. We still have some people here. Sabu Adeola, yeah. he is someone, uh, uh, um, uh, Pappy Martin, um, you know, all of these musicians that people would come to Buffalo and they would be the backup you would come to Buffalo as a major musician and you didn't have to bring nobody with you. You could do your band right here in Buffalo. People would come here and then they would get Al Tenney. They would get this one and that one. And they would put together a group for their gig because the musicians here were so well trained and that good. I think of Buffalo as kind of like some people think of New Orleans. See, my family come from that Mississippi Bayou, uh, Louisiana Delta. When you think of the blues and you think of just, you know, Little Wayne, whoever you want to think of, I mean, it's something in that New Orleans water that they always producing somebody or something that is contributing to the culture. I would say that Buffalo is the same way because we used to say, it must be something in the water because Buffalo is always- <laughs> There's 
one thing that but, Buffalo gets right um, is, our, is, is, is its arts and culture. That's yes, the, but then the look, look at Beverly. Look at Beverly Johnson. Look at yeah. Beverly Johnson, and she was in. She she and I are the same age, by the way. But you know, um, she went to Boston University, but um, or Boston College. But she went to Boston. But she was found here in Buffalo. I remember her doing. Um, uh, fashion shows at the Y on Humboldt, the Humboldt Y, Beverly Johnson, doing a fashion show. <laughs> <laughs> and we were dancing before the show. And when you saw her hit that runway, you already knew. I mean, it was like poetry in motion. She was beautiful. Her sister was at the University of Buffalo. But she you could tell that she was amazing. So there are beautiful women in Buffalo. Buffalo's known for pretty beautiful girls. And I'm not even from Buffalo, I'm from Harlem. But I know that Buffalo has produced a number of great models, not just Beverly, but also um, white models. And people would come to Buffalo looking for models. They would come to Buffalo looking for musicians. And Buffalo, to be so small, we got to realize Buffalo's like what? When I came here, maybe it was like 300,000. Black communities even smaller. Listen, you got communities that are larger than Buffalo that don't have two premier black newspapers, the Criterion and the Challenger. Don't have, um, in fact, two black theater companies, Paul Robeson and Ojima. At a city outside, my daughter went to Miami. They ain't had that in Miami. They barely they wish they had that they out here. <laughs> Even with Juneteenth, I mean, Buffalo. 45 the years third of June. largest Juneteenth in Buffalo, even out here. You think this would, it's not even that big out here in the DMV. Well, uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying like June, 45 years of Juneteenth. I was on the first Juneteenth. That's 1976. I mean, talk, this talk to us the, about your experience with the first Juneteenth festival. That first Juneteenth festival was freaking amazing and let me tell you why we did it we did it to save jefferson avenue yes that was the purpose of juneteenth we said we want something to draw attention to all of the rich culture on jefferson avenue at the time Jefferson was just starting to see the first of its decline. Because when I came, they had the Revlock, the Pine Grill, the Padlocks. Listen, we was eating wings and things. Uh, uh, somebody barbecue. He went to Fillmore, but I forgot his name. Uh, somebody barbecue joint. <laughs> there was ice cream. There was Gigi's. So, there was after hour joints. I mean, it was to me very similar to 125th Street or 116th Street in Harlem. And then when you went downtown, they had the little Harlem. They had about five or six restaurants on William Street that I used to go to quite a bit whenever I really got tired of buff, buff, UB food. I would go down there and eat, you know, collard greens, macaroni and cheese. And I mean, not out of a can. These were people who were cooking. Okay. And Buffalo, because of the location, you had a lot of people coming through Buffalo because they were going to Detroit, they were going to New York, they were going to uh, Toronto. So when people brought me here, when I first came here, they took me to Dan Montgomery's. They were so, they said, listen, we got a place that you can eat a steak 
And yeah. this is the best thing. And it was Dan Montgomery's was. And then have our family all, dinners at did me, mom, and dad. Dan Montgomery, you got Montgomery's dressed up. up, and you went. The food was delicious. And then they said, "Well, guess what? I was here maybe three days. They like we got a little harm on my attitude is here, right?" They said, well, we got a Broadway. You got a Broadway in New York. We got a Broadway in Buffalo. <laughs> it took me downtown. Uh -huh. And yeah, the, the little Harlem was filled with memorabilia. It was like something that was stuck in a time warp. So it reminded me of like Small's Paradise in Harlem. Um, these places. I heard about that in the Nikki Barnes documentary. Yeah. Honey, yeah, I, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, chicken and waffles. It was Wells chicken and waffles. So these were places where you captured the culture, but you had the same thing, and and you had the same thing in Buffalo. And again, Buffalo was that bridge between a lot of bigger cities so people would be stopping in Buffalo. What did they say? Uh, shuffle off to Buffalo? Yep. That was a song from the 50s. Well, now it's now it's Buffalo. Now it's the town. The town now. Well, listen, you can't talk oh. about what was happening in Buffalo if you're not talking about the Vermilion Room, where well, you go get down, up, right? get down. Yep. You should do it. <laughs> and Trunis, who, if we could find all the pictures that Trunis had on that wall, oh and then he had the um, skating rink, everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that skate culture was strong in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. They would be dancing to these skates. There was a strong skating culture in Buffalo. The Vermilion Room would be packed with people. Randy Smith. Um, uh, remember, we had the Braves during that time. Now, we might not have saw them bills. We didn't see OJ. OJ was over there on Hurdle Avenue doing whatever he was doing. But Randy Smith. He sang all that, uh, Mr. Goodbar or something like that? No, Mr. Goodbar was on um, on uh, Elmwood. Yep. There was another play okay. on um, Hurdle. Um, oh, oh, that's why I got my streets mixed yeah, up. Yeah, he was he was hanging out on Hurdle Avenue, but you know there were um, Bob McAdoo was here. No, everybody should know Bob McAdoo now. I think Bob McAdoo, McAdoo of course. <laughs> right. Bob McAdoo lived right on Ellicott. Right. <laughs> right on Ellicott Street. So these are people that we saw. These were people that were with Black people. These were people that were, you would go to the Vermilion Room or whatever, and they'd be there too. You had Michael Copeland with the Bad Habit Pack. That was the Michael one. Michael Angelo Copeland. Yes. Michael Thanks Angelo. That radio Copeland. commercial. The, the old Sprint Man. Yep. So, and the Hot Ice Ski Club. Is, is that what it was called? And he had the Hot Ice Ski Club and he had the first black, he had the first bicycle club. They, yeah, they, they on, the, on the History Channel. Listen. They used to ride their bikes to Niagara Falls. Okay. These were some riding people. And before they were the riding. Soul, right? <laughs> this is before there was go bike. This is before anybody was biking. Mm -hmm. And with that hot ice ski club, that was Ernest Copeland and Michael. Okay. And then all those kids that, but including my daughter, because Maisha's a Copeland, Michael is her is her dad. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know, all of the children that were introduced to skiing, all of those Saturday programs we did, 
Um, Erica went to Erica, who's Ernest's daughter, um, Erica Copeland went to a ski academy. She was such a good skier that she was on the New York State race team. Maisha was on the New York State race team with Erica. Since them two black girls ain't been skiing, there ain't been nobody else skiing in New York State. Since, since those two girls made the state um, girls team um, and Erica skied and Maisha skied in France all over. Um, I, I remember, um, I think they called him Charlie the Tuna. Remember yes. the guy, yes. that was the yes. swimmer? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I like I'm saying. I forgot if you what his record see, was, but yeah, I remember. I do remember. You could see how I'm building a picture that touches on everything from our basketball players. And Buffalo has produced some really good basketball players. Yeah. You know? Throughout um, the years. Throughout the years. Throughout the years. Which I went and to with Trevor I, often. And I'm including Niagara Falls with that because Niagara okay. Falls has some players too. But I'm just saying, Buffalo, I call it small but mighty. Buffalo has produced some amazing artists, um, innovation, like we said, 45 years of Juneteenth, 40 or 45 years of Kwanzaa, you know, um, um, uh, innovation in terms of thought and philosophy. And, and I just wanted to come back on your show just to lift that up. I just want people to know that I am so proud of uh, Drea and yes. um, Pima, um, all of these artists that are, that I, I don't know them all, um, but what I'm seeing and what I am um, hearing is just reminds me of what we did. The only difference they might be is we were all working together. What I mean by that? That is like, true. Yes. That, that, that is true. We that's, will that's, that, that's a hurdle we still haven't got over yet. And I don't think we really artistically connect. Some people do, but it's again, we'll go in the back. All I'm saying is that if there was a jazz performance, and when they were doing, when Pappy and um, his brother would, were playing, and they were doing something, they would have dancers and it would be us. Okay. You know, um, uh, Lorna and Ed Smith were starring in plays together and working together and, and directing together. And then the singers from Omani Music Workshop would be um, featured artists in Lorna's plays and they would have parts. So there was this cross fertilization that um, I don't see it now, but like I said, I'm not as connected artistically, but I want you to know Watusa Coney was in no place better than Watusa Coney, honey. We had- I saw the picture, we saw the picture listen, of you as, as a listen, young girl. Everything, we carry shells, incense, we're the first ones yep. to bring it to Buffalo. Yep. And Buffalo just took it. When I look at Black monarchy, I see yes. what Pony, because that sister Absolutely. is doing it. In Absolutely. fact, I'm rocking wow. her jacket. I'm rocking her jacket. You got it from Black Monarchy. Shout out to Felicia. <laughs> oh, by the way, for our audience, um, I got to shout her out because her stuff yeah. is so bad. Yeah. You know, she just, I go in there and it's like, I'm dropping down $500. It's like, 
Oh, this jacket is 125. I'll take it. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I, want, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say for the audience, uh, I, what I, I mentioned, uh, Soko. Soko is Gail's dog. That was kind of snuck into the picture there. She and <laughs> Gail and my mother are neighbors, so we <laughs> know right. very, very, very well. Well, let me say something about yeah. your mom. Because okay. people don't know how progressive your mom is in terms of education. Okay. When I was at Buff State, she had students from the African American Student Organization come to School 53 mm -hmm. and do a year long program. It was called Ushindi Bandari, which means okay. safe harbor. And we came yeah. in there and we introduced all those kids to what? Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what else? We we actually took the movie, um, what's it called? New Jack City. Yep. Honey, we took that movie and broke it down. Like we we so broke down. We we listened to the um seventh and eighth grade. We they did poetry. We had them do um, exhibits. Um, your mom gave them actually a space in the school. You know how they used to put art up on the walls and all yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she wanted them to get culture. She said, "Gail," she said, "I will. I wonder, can you bring some students from the Buff State to?" you know, the, um, to the school and provide some kind of educational pro. And we did it on Saturday. Like she would have the school open. And before anybody was doing this, she actually had washing machines in the school where kids could wash their clothes. Like she yeah. really met the needs. She would watch and see what the challenges were. Were they, you know, getting enough food at home? Were they eating the right food? Were they able to what? Wash their clothes. Maybe there wasn't a washing machine at home. There was no way for them to wash their clothes in the manner that you can wash it if you put it in the washing machine. I know what that's like because my grandmother had us washing clothes in the bathtub. We used to wash clothes. So everybody didn't have a washing machine. So if you're washing clothes in the bathtub, okay, <laughs> that's a whole lot different than putting your clothes in a washing machine and it's getting washed and, and everything. So your mom was um, an innovative, progressive principal at school 53 and she had not a failing school she made sure that school was meeting all of the necessary um academic milestones that these kids had to meet and at the same time she wanted them to know who they were and so she bought and the students came for they came for free these students came, I picked them up. All they needed was transportation. They didn't know where they was going. So it was like, we need a ride. So Buffalo, if there's a negative about Buffalo, don't ride the bus because it takes too long for the bus to get from the <laughs> west side to the east side. So you had to take two buses to come to the east side of Buffalo, which is ridiculous. It might take you an hour. And if you miss the bus an hour and a half to get from Buff's Day down into the hood. So all I had to do was come pick them up. But I already talked about the innovative educational programs that were happening in the Buffalo Public Schools besides um, Build Academy, School 53, which was run by your, your mom was a definite um, school that was doing um, innovative education. I also talked about Now Valley Shule. Oh, yes. And talked about Freedom School. 
So Buffalo, like Buffalo is looking at the 16, 1619 project in terms of its forming, reforming its curriculum. a couple years ago. But they brought Asa Hilliard in to do the same thing. And he had his PhD in clinical psychology and started, was one of the founders for the association, the African Associate, no, ASCAP, the African Society for Classical, the- ASCAP. Yeah. African Society. African Society for Classical African, something like that. Yeah. I went with Asa, Asa be mad at me because I went with Asa twice to Egypt and I took a Buff State student. So Asa, forgive me for messing up that name, but um, we had a very strong um, membership of um, ASCAT in Buffalo, a very progressive group of individuals that was studying about ancient Kemet and all of that. And we had Garveyites in Buffalo. Yep. And we had Black Panther Party in, in Buffalo. So Buffalo has been innovative in so many ways. Bennett Smith, who was the uh, pastor at St. John's was very, very high up in terms of the civil rights movement as a pastor. So all of that. So thank you for giving me this opportunity Absolutely. to talk about this. Um, I just um, hope that other people, I don't know if they can message you or whatever, if other people have stories and want to talk about oh, Buffalo yeah. during those times, I would love to hear what anybody has to say um, I also, there might be corrections to my story, um, because you know what, that memory, the names yeah. start to get mixed up and all of that, all of us. <laughs> but, the, but the impact, the impact is the same. So, um, again, forgive me if I, um, got a name wrong, but the intention was to just lift up for everyone that's listening to your channel, which I want to say, thank you. The, like this is so important, what you are doing, Doug. I mean, if 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 you if you weren't doing it, besides you and Eva, and I have to say, the Challenger and the Criterion have a lot of history, but we have to speak for ourselves. We have to document our own history. And, you know, years from now, someone will be looking at the work that you're doing, learning about Buffalo and feeling proud of um, either being born in Buffalo, like my two children, um, or spending now most of my life in Buffalo. So I consider myself a Harlem Buffalonian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, a hard community I, worker. <laughs> listen, hard community worker. Um, one day, maybe I'll come on and talk about Freedom Gardens. Okay. Uh, if you have me, but that's more current. But I love the history piece. Thank you so much. And um, all right. All righty. Well, thanks yeah, for being on the Buffalo History Channel. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Peace and love. That's what we always used to say. Peace and love.